we're looking this morning at the Holy Spirit. We talked about faith and um, you know, the uh, guidance of God's Spirit in our life, and we've 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 come to this this time where everybody needs to know about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I want you to take a look at the word "filled" for just a moment, because we're going to talk about that word. That word doesn't mean what you think it means. Okay. Then again, maybe it does. But I want us to look at how you and I can be filled with God's Holy Spirit in our lives. So I'd like for you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And find verse 15. We will be reading 15 through 21. This will be our text. And I'll make some connections. Also, I have some bad uh, allegories for you. I'm just going to tell you right now, they're bad allegories, okay? So get that up front. Um, but I think they make the point. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. Paul's writing, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. I just want to throw a little commentary in here. The days are getting worse and worse and worse. Would you agree? Of course, I think they were saying that in Paul's day, too. The first century is not much different than the 21st century, folks. It's just getting worse. So live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly. But understand that the Lord wants uh, understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I want to use an illustration and an allegory to start off with. And like I said, this is a bad allegory. But there was a man who saw his neighbors and his friends buy brand new cars. And over a period of time, he finally broke down and he decided to buy a brand new car. Nothing strange about that, right? But this man knew nothing about automobiles. Again, not too shocking, right? He loved to show off his car. He cleaned it, he washed it, he polished it, he kept it in great shape. People come over and he show them how proud he was of the car. He showed them all the, you know, with the mirrors where, he, where his wife can put on his, her makeup if they want to as they're driving. Showed them all the cup holders in the car, all the USB ports he can plug in to charge whatever it is you're charging. Just, just, just a wonderful car. But everywhere he went, you saw him pushing that car. <laughs> occasionally, occasionally, there would be a downhill run, and he'd actually get in the car as it coasts down the hill, which made him happy, except he realizes for every downhill he, had to, he, he went, there was an uphill he had to push it. And now he's thinking, you know, even though he was proud of this car, proud of this car, in some ways, he was kind of thinking, this is a burden. I, I'm not sure I really want this car now. So a friend, a friend of his, a close friend of his, came and says, can I show you something about your car? Well, sure. And so he held up the key to the car. He said, you know what this is? It's a, it's a key. I said, yeah, it's for your car. Yeah, I unlocked the door with it. Yeah. Well, do you know you have a little place inside the car you can put it. So why don't you p sit behind the wheel and put it in? So he puts it in. Now it says, give it a turn. It's the ignition switch. Turn it on. And he turns it on and it starts up. Now he says, take the little lever and drop it into the letter D for drive. And he did that. And cautiously, the car moved forward. He says, this is wonderful. It wasn't that he couldn't drive the car, because obviously he could drive it going downhill. But now all of a sudden, he, just, he says, why didn't anybody tell me there was an engine in the car? 
Now, it's a silly allegory, right? A silly allegory. You buy a car, most of us understand that there's an engine in the car. But, here's the rub. How many of us are living our lives with our salvation without any power? And sometimes we're thinking, you know, oh yeah, when we're coasting downhill, this is great, but when we have to go uphill, not so much. When, when, do, you, do we really fully understand that when we got saved, God put an engine in our salvation? Now, some of you are going to take offense because you think I'm calling the Holy Spirit an engine, and I'm not. I, I, I mean, no disrespect to the Holy Spirit at all. But the Holy Spirit is our room in our lives. Or as the song would say, it's our umption in our gumption. So let me function, function, function. Some of you who have been in Sunday school understand what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is our power, our oom. And sometimes we've been carrying and pushing our salvation, wondering what in the world was I, was I thinking. Not really understanding that the key to the ignition is our faith in our salvation. Are you following? When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, somebody says it turns your drudgery into pizzazz. Just let that soak in for a little bit. It's okay to enjoy your salvation. It's, in, it's all right to, to enjoy your Christian life. There was an old evangelist once went around the country saying, it's fun being saved. But we live our lives as if we're going to a funeral every other day. It should be fun to come to church. Now, I'm an otter personality type. If you are a lion person, the, the, Gary Smalley has four, he uses four animals. A lion, some of you are lions, type A personalities. Some of you are like me, you're, you're an otter, you're a people person. Um, and, and then my wife, for example, is a golden retriever. She's just a little, uh, she, she's just a little cute little dog until you cross her or you do something towards her kids and she will show, her, show you her teeth. We had a golden retriever when Stephen was born. We had the golden retriever before Stephen was born, a couple years before he was born. And as Stephen grew up, this dog grew up with him. And one day, as she was trying to get him ready to go and get him all dressed up and everything, he got, she got him together and then she got herself together. And while she was getting herself together, the little boy decided he was going out the front door. The front door of our house. And out the front door he went. And right beside him was that precious little, cute little golden retriever. And he's walking down the street, one of the neighbors notices. So he, she walks up to, to St Stephen to try to bring him back to the church. The dog would not let her anywhere near Stephen. She had to coax Stephen to come along, and she kept her distance from the dog. That's my wife. But some of you are lions, and, and, and I'm, I'm an otter. And you know what otters like to do is tease lions. We get, we get, you, you got, you know, the lions are very focused, very, very uh, goal driven, and work comes first. Me, I have to find the play in the work to get the work done. But nothing thrills me more than to try to play with a lion who's trying to get his work done. <laughs> some of you are married, some of you are lions and you're married to an otter. That should be a fun household. I don't know where I was going with that, but we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it should be fun to come to church. It ought to be, life should be fun. It shouldn't be a drudgery if you have Christ in your life. But for some reason, church people are just downers sometimes. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know if that's where an amen goes, Billy, but okay. So what are the requirements 
of, of the Spirit-filled life? I think we need, first of all, to have a complete commitment. A complete commitment. You need to bow to God in full surrender. You need to bow to the Holy Spirit in full surrender. You need to bow to Him. And I use the, the personal pronoun Him intentionally because we know that the Holy Spirit is one of the three Godheads. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. I don't have time to talk about the Trinity today, but God in three separate personalities, but yes, united together in one God. I, don't, get, I, don't get me started on it. We could spend, you know, like forever. In fact, we will spend forever trying to understand that. With God, but don't think, and this is, where, this is where I want to get, don't think that you're some kind of vessel. And of course, we've, we've heard sermons like this. I probably preach sermons like this. That, you know, you're, you're some sort of vessel, and the Holy Spirit just pours stuff into you, so you want more of the feeling. It doesn't work that way. You're a dwelling place. Listen to what I'm saying. You're a dwelling place. You're not a cup of, that holds water that occasionally leaks or somebody drinks from. You are a dwelling place. And when God comes within you into your dwelling place and he has full control of your dwelling place, guess what? You become a temple. You become the, a temple for, God, for the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 6. It should be behind me. It should be in your notes. Around verse 19. Don't you realize, Paul says, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives where? In you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourselves, for God bought you with a high price. Gina and I had looked some, many years ago, looked at some houses, and we found a little house. It wasn't a little house, it was a big house. Um, and it had a little casita. It had a, it, you had an archway. You came in through a courtyard area to get to the front door. And off to the side was a little casita. A two-story casita. So that a guest, it's like a guest suite. It had a little kitchenette and, and, you know, a little stove. Remember that? I think we were in the White Mountains. We were um, off of wherever that White Apache area. And uh, we saw that little thing. We couldn't afford it right next to the golf course. But, you know, it was nice to look at it. But imagine having a home where you have a, a place so that a guest in can come and stay, and it's actually a suite. Here's your, here's your, here's your room, this is, here's your little kitchenette, there's, here, there's your bath and your towels. And, uh, make yourself at home. And sat, in fact, here's the key to the house, and to, to, to the casita, and to your house. This is to my house, this is, this is your key. Here's another key for the extra car in the garage if you need to go someplace. Feel free. Yeah, obviously, listen, mi casa es su casa. Right? We want to be hospitable. But you say, you know, I'm gonna, I've got to go to the office, get some work done. I'll be back in a few hours. But make yourself at home. Anything you need, anything you want, this is your house. My house is your house. So you're gone, you come back, and you're looking for your guests, and there's nowhere to be found. Not in the casita, not in the living room, not in the, not in the family room. You find him in your bedroom, going through your papers. He's been in your study, going through your mail. And so you kind of, you kind of shock and you kind of clear your voice and you go, <clears throat> can I help you? He goes, oh no, I'm fine. I just didn't know you made that much money. Oh, and by the way, I was reading your journal. Some of these entries, dude, I don't understand. What are we, what's going on? And, and as you're, you feel your temperature rising, <laughs> And you feel very invaded. You're doing your, you're doing your best to try to reframe because you did say, mi casa es su casa. Did you mean it? No, we don't mean it. There, we, got, we got places that is ours and nobody else. Listen, you are, once you come to God and you, 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 you come to him with total commitment, you are saying, I'm no longer myself. 
You, I am your dwelling place. I'm your dwelling place. And by the way, he already has been through your journals several times, and he knows more about you than you do. But here's what we do with the Holy Spirit. Hey, we've got this nice little place for you. Now you just stay over there. And this room over here, this room over here, you don't want to go in that room. That's my junk room. That's where, that's, that's my room. And it's so junky, in fact, that you can't even begin to know where to start to clean it up. Have you ever been in places like that? And here's what God's saying. I want that room, too. And even though you don't know how to start cleaning it up, this is what you can do. Let me help you. See, he wants the whole thing, not just a little casita, not just a little guest room, not just a little kitchenette. He wants the whole dwelling place. Total com and complete commitment. By the way, I'm stuck on C's this morning. Not only does it mean having complete commitment in, in, the, in the requirement of, uh, of a spirit-filled life, it also means continual control. Continual control. Many times people make a commitment, but they fail to understand verse 18. I want you to take a look at verse 18. This is a very important verse. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul does something in his writings that's very, that's, that's not unusual, but he does it very well. And that is, he, he takes something and he contrasts it, then at the same time he compares it. Do you understand what I'm saying? He, he shows the separation, the contrast between the two, and then he brings, it, brings you back and says, now let's compare. And that's what he does here. Notice he says, don't be drunk. Don't be drunk with wine, but what? Say it. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I just want to make sure you're awake. You notice Paul doesn't say, don't steal and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You notice Paul doesn't say, don't commit adultery and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't commit murder and be filled with... He doesn't say any of that. What he says is, don't be drunk on wine, but filled... That sounds unusual, doesn't it? Except... Look at the contrast. Being filled with the Spirit is in contrast to being drunk. Being drunk is the devil's substitute for being filled with the Spirit. You go, oh, so I can't drink? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, don't be drunk. Here's the thing. When you are dr if you are drunk... If you've had a few too many to drink and you get in your car and you get stopped, you are driving what? Under the influence. Your control is not yours anymore. You are being controlled by a different influence in your life. You following me so far? Under the influence. He says don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You notice when somebody's drunk, their speech pattern, their thought pattern, their walk, their talk, every, their thoughts are, are changed. They're changed. But in comparison, don't be drunk, be filled with the Spirit. Let God control you. Let God... But be under the influence of the Holy Spirit so that your walk and your talk and your speech and your, your thought patterns are different. That's where an amen goes. You know, here, here's our problem. There's too many of us. I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to come back to that. That's contrast. Here's the comparison. The comparison is that... Being filled with the Holy Spirit is like being drunk with God. Also, let me ask this, this. How does one get drunk and stay drunk? Now, I know none of our deacons know this, but that was a joke. <laughs> How do you get junk, drunk and stay drunk? Anybody have a clue? I'll tell you. You drink... And then you keep drinking. Right? You need to understand what Paul is saying here. The Greek, we have no English 
the, it's poor grammar, but in the Greek it says, be being filled. Be being filled with the Spirit. In other words, one single drink, huh. but if you want to get drunk, you drink a lot, and then you keep drinking to stay drunk. God is saying, and Paul is saying here, don't be drunk with wine, be drunk with the Holy Spirit. Keep, you know, drink and keep drinking of God's Spirit in your life. And here's my problem, this is what I was going to say. Some of us Christians who are Bible-believing Christians and church-going people who are so loving, we, sit so, we get sobered way too quick. We get sobered up way too quick when we're talking about being drunk in the Spirit. Now, I don't mean to offend you. I don't want to offend anybody here. But it talk, it's all about control. It's all about commitment. Give God control. Be committed. So, for us, like I said, we are to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. We are to have continual control, continual commitment. Also, if we're going to be filled with the Spirit, we need conscious claiming. This was I had to really stretch for this. Conscious claiming to stay with the seas. Conscious claim. But it basically means doing something intentionally. Being filled is a complete commitment, continual control, and a conscious claiming. You just, you just claim the Spirit of God in your life. How do you come to know God as your personal Savior? How do you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior? How do you get salvation? Don't you just claim it? You confess your sins. This is easy. You confess your sins. By the way, confessing is nothing more than agreeing with what God already knows anyway. Okay, he already knows about it. He, that thing that you don't think anybody knows about, God knows about just confess it. You might as well. Repent. That is, turn from what you're doing to turn to someone, which is Jesus. And you, you allow, you, you trust and claim God's salvation in the gospel of, in Christ. And then we wait for some sort of infilling. Uh, we go to prayer meetings. We, we have folks that, and, and, and please, I'm going to be, I, I don't mean to be derogatory here, and I certainly don't mean any ill will. But Paul tells us, I don't care what kind of things you think you have, what kind of spirit you have. If you don't love, you're nothing more than a resounding gong or a clanging symbol, something, something that's annoying. God has gifts to give, and we're going to be talking about that soon. We're going to talk about the gifts of God. We're just talking about getting God in, in your life, in your dwelling place. One of the Godheads in your dwelling place. The Godhead of the Son saves you. Now you've got you to live a sanctified life. And do that, you have got to have God's Spirit in your life. And you do that by claiming the Spirit of God. You claim that Jesus as your Savior for your salvation. And you also claim the Holy Spirit in the same way. It's not a matter of feeling. It's not a matter of feeling you have the Lord Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit in your life. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of filling. Remember, it's not a, it's not a vessel, something you're born. It's a dwelling place that inhabits you. If you follow me, it reminds me of Men in Black. You know, the the, the creature from outer space puts on a, a on a cheap. Hager suit, you know, Hager, play on words. You, you, some of you know, so, and some of you are laughing, you know. It, it's about an indwelling. An indwelling. A continuous claiming. You take it by faith. Once you've made a complete commitment, a fully surrendered, every key, every key, every room, you have the right then to proclaim the gifts of the Spirit. Remember, God desires for you to fill, he, 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 he his desires to fill you with his spirit. To fi that's his desire. And he promises to do that. In John chapter 7, Jesus stood up and shouted, If you are thirsty, come to me and drink. Let me illustrate what we do here sometimes. 
I, I, did, I did some baseball games Friday and Saturday. I came off Saturday. I was, I mean, it's, it's, it was pleasant in Phoenix. It was only 100. It was very pleasant in Phoenix. I drank four gallons of water, literally four gallons of water, in two days, plus some electrolytes. Now I was, I'm still thirsty today. So I got a glass of water here. You know, you're thirsty. I'm thirsty. Boy, that looks good. I know it's purified water. I know it's clean water because Gypsy got it for me. And he wouldn't put anything bad in it. Much. <laughs> Sometimes you think he does. But he doesn't. And you go, oh, that's a nice looking glass of water. Cold. It's clear. It's fresh. But you don't drink. You don't drink from it. You don't take. Despite your thirst, you don't drink from the glass God wants you to have. And God has promised you, and His desire is to fill you with His Spirit. And so we've got to claim that. And for whatever reason, sometimes we fail to appropriate what God is offering. Folks, listen, I, I'm, I want to say something here. <clears throat> if you have Christ in your life, if you ask Christ to come and save you, you, you should have the Holy Spirit in your life. But I think sometimes we're afraid to pick up the glass and drink it. You know why? Because we want to be in control. We don't want to be committed. Therefore, we don't claim it. And then we wonder, why don't I have an infilling of God's Spirit in my life? Well, how do I know I have God's Spirit in your life? What is the result of a Spirit-filled life, right? Look, look at this, look at the next slide here. Ephesians chapter 5, this is part of our text. Don't be drunk on wine because you ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks to everything, to the God the Father, in the name of the uh, Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So let me tell you, there's three things. That, uh, there's probably more, but I just picked three. If you have the Holy Spirit in your life, here's what the results are. There should be a spirit of adoration. A spirit of adoration. The result of the spirit-filled life is adoration. And, you're, and what are your, what, what's the spirit of adoration? It's the, it's, it's the acknowledgement that God is in your life. That you're glad to have God in your life. You've got a brand new car with a brand new engine. Start the motor up and let's go. You know what people do when they first get a brand new car? Anybody want to know? They get in and drive it. They play with the buttons, you know. Then they pull out the owner manual and figure out what they did wrong. The, you know, the, you know the, the, the owner manual, the destructions. Singing hymns, hymn, uh, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. You're going to worship. You're going to be singing and you're going to be worshiping. You're going to be praising God. And in your heart and your life, if you have a spirit-filled life, there will be the spirit of adoration. Again, look at John chapter 4, verse 24. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You know how you can tell whether you have a spirit-filled life? Because all day long, you wake up and you start saying, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Praise God. Jesus, I love you. Now, I, some of you say, will have said to me, and some of you have said to me, and I've heard some of you, you can't sing. You've told me you can't sing. And so you come to church and you sit there and you don't sing. There's a problem with that. 
Because first of all, if anybody's listening to your singing, then they're not singing and they're not praising either. And the only person you have to please with your singing is God. And God is easy to please. In fact, he doesn't care if you can carry a tune in the bucket. And by the way, I don't even know what that means. Carrying a tune in the bucket. I just don't, it just doesn't, that, that just doesn't sit well with me. I just don't understand. <clears throat> but if you can't sing on, in key, you go to your brand new car, you roll up the windows, and you start singing as loud as you can. And watch people stare at you as you drive down the road. <laughs> It is the greatest thing in the world. You don't have to be a good singer to praise God. You don't. There has to be, there's, there is this sense that your life is now a temple that God resides in. And so the song that you are singing is not your song anyway. It's a song that God has placed in your heart. Because he's placed a new song in your heart. That old drinking song is gone, and this new drinking song has arrived. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you following me here? Okay. Psalms 40, verse 3. He has given me a new song to sing and a hymn to praise. Two, there's a spirit of appreciation. In, Psalm, in Ephesians 5, 20, And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of God. Uh, in, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A spirit-filled Christian is not grumbly hateful. Listen to me. A spirit-filled Christian is not grumbly hateful. They are humbly graceful. Do you get, you get the difference? Get the difference? A spirit-filled Christian gives thanks. Now, not just sometimes, not just part of the times, but all the time. And I, I will confess to you, there are some things that just, just aren't good in our lives. Things happen. Things happen. Can I talk about Stephen for just a minute? He's not here. I get a phone call from my wife. Stephen's got a problem. Okay, I know what the problem is. Anyway, he had a dead battery. Nothing is, you know, today, you, you, your battery doesn't drain little by little. You just wake up one morning, you go, and it just don't start. Right, John? In, these, in this day and age, you just get, it doesn't start. And so, you know, he had to go through the trouble of putting a new battery in his car. That's not fun. Nobody wants to spend $300 or four, $250 for a battery. Uh, by the way, side note. If, if a car battery that starts your car only lasts three years, I wonder how long a battery, who is, which is an electric car, lasts. I don't know. But anyway, that's, I, I digress. Is that too political? Anyway, moving on. Appreciation. Even though things don't work, work out right, even though things aren't working out right, that's no reason not to be grateful. It really isn't. Because I am a temple of God. God's Spirit's living within me. I may not like the situation I am, but you know what? God is bigger than that situation. I don't have to worry. I can pray. You know that. You, you, you've heard this before, right? You can't worry and pray at the same time. Try it. You can't do it. One more thing. If you have a feeling of a spirit-filled life you have a spirit of adoration you have a spirit of appreciation folks you also have a spirit of accommodation Ephesians 5 20 and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ whoa 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 I hear the guy I can already hear the guys saying no 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 Paul says for the wives to be submissive to the husband <laughs> the problem with that is when he gets done saying, he says, we are to be submissive to each other. See, we don't read far enough. Right? This is not a woman's thing. By the way, when a husband is submissive to the will of God, your wife will be with you. Right? Ladies, am I right? 
You have a man of God submitting to the will of Christ, treating you like Christ treats the church. Trust me, guys, you're in like Flynn. Whatever that means. Appreciation. There's no way that you can be, uh, you can do, you can be submissive with apart from the Holy Spirit in your life. When when you praise God in bad circumstances, that doesn't mean you approve it. Whoop! I, I dropped back up, dropped back down. Have you ever heard somebody say, or perhaps you have said, "I know my rights. I have rights, and I know my rights." Whoa, 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 whoa. You know what? You have a right to go to hell. Or you can have Christ in your life and go to heaven. That's your choice. But let me ask you this. What right or what rights does a dead person have? We are to be dead in our old self and raised to a new life. We are buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Jesus says, on a daily basis, crucify yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. What rights does a dead person have? Somebody wrote, and I wrote this down, show a person their rights and you have a Revolution. Teach a person their responsibility and you have a revival. Isn't that true? So many of us our Christians want a revolution. Instead, what we need to do is submissing to one another through the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can bring about an acknowledgement of our responsibility as Christians to bring about a revival. We could be that catalyst for revival if we would just be submissive to the will of God and submissive to one another. You and I need to really work and learn to love each other and submit to each other out of fear of the Lord. You see, I don't submit to you. I submit to God. I submit to God. And you submit to me the same way that I submit to you. You submit to God. You, you following that? How wonderful to be around spirit-filled brothers and I mean spirit-filled brothers and sisters who have learned about this spirit of accommodation. I'm going to brag on you. Don't get a big head because the doors aren't big enough for your head to go through if you do. Let me just tell you what I'm proud about our church. We tend to love each other and be submissive to one another. Almost to... We have, we have some things to overcome. Please don't... We're not doing this perfectly. We're not perfect. That's why Christ died for us, right? We're still... When we put the tables down, everybody complained about the tables being put down. A day is coming when we're going to have to pick up the tables and put chairs back down, and you're going to start complaining again. But you forget about the revival that God's bringing about. Do you understand? The more people we have here, the more we grow and the more we reach people for God's kingdom, not our church, God's kingdom. If This church will grow if we're reaching people for God's kingdom. We don't worry about church growth. We worry about kingdom growth. And guess what? We have to work doubly as hard to continue loving people. Because if we can do that, you've got a whole bunch of people loving you. If you think you've got a lot of people loving you now, just wait until we have 500 people here loving you. I've been in churches that have 15,000 members. And Gina and I both said it was one of the lo most loving, inviting churches to be in. But they worked hard at it. They worked hard at it. They understood their responsibility. So I'm going to ask you a question, a personal question. Do not answer out loud. For fear you might get the answer wrong. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? 
Are you right now consciously filled with the Spirit of God in your life? By the way, this is not a request. If you read it, this is a command that we need to obey, to be filled, to be being filled with the Spirit of God. When you are filled with the Spirit, do you know what you'll find? Do you know what you'll find if you're filled with the Spirit of God? <laughs> you will find a beautiful car with the, the best engine ever. You don't have to worry about pushing it anymore. But you cannot be filled with God's Spirit if Jesus is not a part of your life. You understand? So, are you willing to give your heart to Jesus to be filled with the Spirit? Well, Pastor, I did that when I was nine years old. That's me. I, I gave my heart. I gave Jesus my heart. But I didn't always, I wasn't always con continually being filled. I didn't always have that commitment. I didn't always make that commitment. And I had to, I really had to work at it. But I didn't have to work at it. It wasn't hard work for me. God had to work through me. I just had to turn, turn, turn him loose in my life. But if you're hitting, sitting here today and you don't know Jesus, you don't know about that engine that wants to come roaring to life in you. And I would hope that you don't leave here without Jesus this morning. Give your heart to him. I'm just going to ask you to bow your head and pray as the instrumentalists and vocalists come back on the stage. Father, you are... You are such a loving, merciful, and generous God. But a day is coming when that generosity, that grace that you've given to us, will be a time of judgment. Father, you have, whatever we think of ourselves, you have made us. And whatever you make is not junk. If we have your spirit in our lives, we have a beautiful car with a strong engine. And Father, the ignition, the ignition key is that faith. The faith to believe in the word of God that you've given us. The faith to believe that Jesus died for our sins, rose again on the third day. I just pray, Father, there will be somebody here this morning will take the key and crank the ignition up and go vroom today. And I ask this in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a song of invitation, a song of commitment. Coy's going to be in front. If, if Coy's busy, I'll come down. If I'm busy, one of our deacons will come down. But you come as we sing.